All right, we are ready to begin. Welcome everyone. Thank you for taking out a little bit of uh, your time on these busy days, whether it is already May 19th where you are or still May 18th where some of us are. We thank you very much. My name is Diana Sinton. I'm the executive director of UCGIS. Uh, let me uh, advance my slide here. Um, and I want to talk with you about what we're gonna to have today. We have a very busy packed 90 minutes of activities. You've all been doing an introductory poll that would have been there when you logged in perhaps. We're gonna do just a very, very brief welcome and greetings in a moment. Um, and then we're gonna immediately go into a panel that we have of educators. Really everybody on this Zoom call today is one educator, an educator in one form or another, but we have separated for the sake of the conversation today, the group into two, one of people who are whose primary jobs right now has to do with direct education, working with students and another um, uh, set of people who are administrative leaders. Uh, and then if we um, are, if we manage to stay on the uh, time correctly, we'll have time for a group discussion with everybody at the end. So I just wanna say um, thank you to everybody whose uh, names and faces are on this um, organizing and host screen. What we're part of right now is a panel that we're calling the Convergence Panel, which is the uh, culmination of many, many months of activity around uh, conversations, multiple panels that have happened around the, the globe, around the world, around, um, resilience in GI science education. And it was really our, our leaders, Dave Unwin, Karen Kemp, and Nick Tate, who launched all of this uh, around when COVID happened. But I want to very much thank everyone else on this screen for contributing to these series of panels. What we're going to launch into right now is our first educators panel. Um, we have Serena Kotzia from University of Pretoria in South Africa, uh, Jerry Miller from Johns Hopkins University, and Jerry also works um, with Esri, Kate Parks from University of Southampton in the UK, Sarah Fabricant from University of Zurich, and if he's joined us, we've got John Lowry too from um, Massey University in New Zealand. So uh, everyone has got their marching orders for this this panel, we've got a series of questions here, which each of these individuals is going to just take a few minutes to respond to. And um, at the end of those uh, five presentations, we'll have a little bit of opportunity for um, some discussion too. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Serena is gonna go first. And Serena, I think you have the opportunity to speak, and I think if I can't remember whether you you were going to share anything, but yeah, I don't have any slides. Perfect, that's fine. That's totally fine. I am going to um, mute myself and turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Diane. So um, as she said, I'm from South Africa, uh, from the southern hemisphere here on the African continent. It looks like uh, not too many other people here. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this global conversation. And uh, let's uh, go right into the first question, the most successful practice that I implemented for the first time. So my background is in computer science. I've done a lot of teaching and programming languages, databases, spatial databases, uh, all kinds of advanced data stuff. And then four years ago, I also started teaching cartography. So it was a bit, it's, a, it's still a bit new to me. Uh, it's a foundational model, module that we have. Uh, it uh, leads on to second and third year modules in GIA spatial analysis, remote sensing and geodesy. And we've got students from a wide range of uh, programs, geography, environmental science, geoinformatics, meteorology, geology, computer science also, and information systems. And uh, the things that I wanna share to, with you is about uh, how to teach. Well, I, I, had, I forced myself during the lockdown to change a few things. So for me, it was an opportunity to do things that I uh, probably would have liked to have done earlier, but maybe didn't always find the time. So I think when you teach uh, cartography, there are three things. The first thing is you need to know the principles. Then I think you need to know them to, to be able, for example, to critique a map. And then finally, you also need to have the skills to make a map. And in, in this regard, I last year took the opportunity to give them lots of uh, online tests with definitions and theory and things like that. 
And then I had the narrated, the famous narrated PowerPoints, and this gave me the opportunity to focus the classes only on math discussion, so we could teach math during, during the classes. And the last thing uh, that's maybe common, play, common everywhere else, but uh, at our university not really used is that I, in previous years, I forced the students to use different software products like uh, QGIS, ArcGIS and MathBox to, do, to create maps because I always feel that they shouldn't be married to a single product. So QGIS was too, uh, too much to download, so we switched to Inkscape. And I think that was uh, really successful because now the students didn't focus on the GIS and the layers and things like that. They only focused on the map design. So I think that's a that's an age old cartography principle. From but for me, it was the first time that I used it. Then, if we look forward in terms of uh, challenges for the next few years. I think for us in South Africa, because the vaccine rollout is really uh, slow, I think for the next year, we'll, we'll have a challenge with integrity and quality of education. We're trying to do a lot of uh, written exams on campus, but every now and again, there's a cluster outbreak and then we can't continue with that. So that's, that's to us a challenge. And then the other thing that goes hand in hand with that is you have to be agile and flexible all the time. You make, you make your plans and then they change. Over the two to three year period, I think a lot of us are going to adjust our teaching approach. So um, everything that we learned in the past year, we're going to rethink, redesign face-to-face -face and online activities. Because I don't think, you know, seeing that we've survived last year, that we now have a perfect online environment to do teaching. There's still a lot that needs to be done. And I think that's going to keep us busy in the next two to three years. And then finally, in the longer term, I think we have two major challenges, and this may also be different, slightly different in South Africa than, than other countries. And the first one is that um, is educational equality and equity. So for many of our students, online teaching is only accessible if they have the money to move to a campus or to an environment where there's internet. And the second thing is if they can move to an environment where they're away from family responsibilities and family chores and things like that. So that, that is a challenge. So even, you know, a switch to online is, is going to take education away from a lot of students in South Africa. And the second thing is the campus experience. So first of all, we could see this year when the students come back, they just love the social interaction, getting to know each other, finding study buddies, talking to each other. Um, and then the second thing also I think in a South African context is that our campus is a very well kept, kept campus, it's a very nice environment, so we give the opportunity to students from all walks of life or from coming from rural villages to experience this kind of environment. And um, if, we, if we switch to more hybrid and to more online, there's a risk that we're going to lose that and I think that that will be uh, sad for our students in any case. So I think these challenges are slightly different than, than in other parts of the, of the world, but for us in South Africa, definitely, I think on the longer term, these are going to be our challenges. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Serena. That was, uh, that was great. And thank you very much for, um, for staying within the, the time. And um, thank you for sharing your cat uh, with, your, with the audience as well, too. Um, Okay, our next panelist uh, uh, from the education group going to respond to this is uh, Jerry Miller from Johns Hopkins University and Esri. Jerry, okay. you're here, right? Yes, I am here. Yes. And, uh, and you have, I think you have, you should have control to share. Um, it says host disabled participants. Oh sharing. gosh, okay, sorry. And also my video is turned on, but I think you guys have to, um, uh, or someone has okay, Cheryl, I'm sorry, I didn't have this. I, I thought it was already set up. No uh, all participants. There you go, video is here. Yes, there we go. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you. So let's go ahead and 
talk about this. I don't have a nice, pretty, well-behaved kitty, but I'll share some remarks um, from kind of both two perspectives, as um, Diana mentioned, as a sector lead for education team at Esri. I'll share some observations just in terms of working with the broader community, with lots of educational institutions, as well as still faculty at Johns Hopkins University. So I teach WebJS, I teach spatial analytics, and I still do a lot of program administration sort of duties. So I'll share some remarks um, uh, kind of from both of these perspectives. Um, and a lot of the remarks or a good amount of the remarks that I'll make are kind of tied to this fundamental shift that we have observed, not because of COVID, but way before COVID, of kind of moving from this old era of, you know, being tied to the office in the lab, only certain people doing GIS, working with lots of complex applications, to kind of this new era of lightweight apps. We can work and we can study everywhere. We can do things on any device. GIS is for everyone sort of thing. So again, this shift started happening way before COVID, but COVID accelerated it a lot. And some of the um, um, some of the best practices and challenges, if you will, I'll kind of tie back to some of this. So successful practice, um, wearing the Esri hat in terms of kind of ob observing um, practices and things that have worked in many institutions, kind of broadly speaking, one was collaboration. So collaboration, we'll look at the campus, collaboration between different departments to kind of come together and basically work that this notion that we can't do it alone, we have to work with others. Um, on campus. So some examples of that, for example, working with IT offices to either provide access to technology or to GIS, uh, virtualize GIS, um, enable single sign-on to facilitate that easier access, working with instructional resource and design centers um, and those departments that serve um, the broader community to, again, help us transition courses from in-person to online. Again, we saw a lot of camaraderie happening for many institutions and obviously some, some it didn't, but that was a best practice. Again, notion that we can't do this alone. So we have to work with others on, across campus. Move to cloud and that's kind of the, you know, what I mentioned earlier, we saw as a best practice, we saw lots of educators just because again, students had to be remote. They didn't have access necessarily to hardware or to you know, other things. Um, we saw a lot of educators reevaluating educational objectives to see what is it that we can do just with cloud only GIS, with a SaaS sort of an environment. And of course, granted everyone had internet, so kind of revolve things around that only requiring that internet access. That could still be a challenge. It could still be a challenge in many areas. Um, but we kind of saw that shift because so much can we do can be done now just with online, right? Um, so we saw a little bit of that. And again, kind of that helps with that fundamental shift and fundamental move. So as a best practice, that was an observation. So Jade, you had as an educator, as a you know, course instructor, faculty myself, our program has always been online. So COVID in a sense, just in terms of teaching style, teaching what we do, um, it didn't affect us as much, but the, you know, what, what we did have to do, and particularly myself, is kind of show a lot more flexibility, a lot of sort of um, extra kindness. When our students were, a lot of them were working professionals, a lot of them were juggling families, a lot of them were juggling COVID issues, whether themselves or families, little kids, um, their own working and professional environments, struggling with Zoom fatigue all along. So we had to, to, to be very, very flexible. And um, along with that, and again, to have that little bit of extra kindness, but along with that, we still had to follow our academic policy and our academic rules as well, and just kind of maintain that balance. But fortunately, administration-wise for the university, we saw lots of support in terms of COVID. But that's something that stood out sort of as a best practice all across and a lot of our faculty as well. So in terms of the challenges, um, and I won't go over short, medium, or long term, but again, sort of kind of looking at the you know, broader community things that we have seen, requests that we that have come across, still a lot of, despite that sort of move to SaaS and anything that we can do where a student just requires internet access, um, we, we saw, still see a lot of sort of access or virtualization, or I don't have the hardware to run something sort of a challenge. And that's gonna continue to probably linger and persist there for a little bit. Hopefully one day we won't have to deal with it. But, um, but again, the, the, the importance of kind of minimizing some of this, it's um, a good idea to think about. Staying current as educators in this field, 
Um, that's, I, I think it's a challenge for everyone as an educator myself. It's again, we're so busy juggling multiple things, doing multiple things. Staying current is a true challenge. I don't think that's gonna disappear whether it's three years from now or 50 years from now, as long as we're in this field. And the, the only other thing I wanna specifically call out as a challenge, again, maybe not so much tied to a specific class as an instructor. Um, it's always when we have a, you know, our own classes, it's easier to create a community and you know students network network and work with one another collaboratively but broadly speaking at a more so at a program level it's been very difficult to provide student networking opportunities um, in in the covid days and even for an online program um, it, it was not the easiest but, easiest, but still we had events. We had other kinds of things that we can bring students together or students and alumni together and students and potential employers together, students and industry associations together. And it, it, it has been very, very difficult. And I do foresee that as a kind of a lingering remaining challenge as long as this virtual world continues to persist and we're living in, in it, um, that we can be doing much better when it comes to some of these networking opportunities. So with that, hopefully um, I am within my allotted five Five minutes. I'll stop sharing and I'll um, send it back over to you, Diana. Thank you very much. I'm going to um, bring up my screen again with the slides here. Uh, there we go. Excellent. All right, Jerry, thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter in our educators panel is going to be Kate Parks from University of Southampton. Hello, Kate. Hello, and I found the button, so that's always good. Um, so it was really interesting listening to other people speak. Um, I wondered whether they'd seen my notes because I think a lot of what I'm going to say is what the, the previous two have, all, have, just, um, have just said. So starting off with question one, the most successful practice that I implemented. Um, and again, I think this is something I think it was Serena mentioned, it's, it's something I'd been meaning to do for a very long time. Um, I could see the benefits of it, but I really didn't have the push to, to do it. And that's to sort of take more of a flipped approach to my teaching, um, which I always took to mean, you give the students stuff to do first, and then in the sort of interactive sessions, you discuss what they've done. Um, I'm not sure whether from the poll, people have a slightly different definition of that. Um, so doing that was something which, yeah, I meant to do for a long time and COVID gave me the, the kick that I needed in order to actually make that change. And it, it went really well. Um, I think I possibly went overboard. And I think this is something that a lot of my colleagues across many disciplines have found. We gave students too much um, and they were overwhelmed. So I think I would rein myself in a bit next year or maybe give the same amount for the, but make it clearer you must do, could do, sh uh, must do, should do, could do kind of thing. Um, the other thing that I've taken on has been, again, something I should have done, I've been aware of for ages, but haven't had the, the push to, to adopt it, has just been really simple use of kind of the interactive technologies to get feedback on how students are, are progressing um, and any query. So using things like a Microsoft form or Google form, um, or um, the, the Padlet or something like that, just to get anonymous feedback on common queries. Um, I also set up a, a team site um, and used that to kind of collate queries, have discussions with students, and that worked, um, worked really well. Um, in terms of the challenges, <laughs> again, this, was, this is probably very repetitive from the previous two people. Um, the, I think in the short term, we're going to need to be agile in our teaching. So um, I was talking with colleagues earlier today and we were focusing on field work um, rather than uh, GIS specifically. Um, and I think we're going to need to have activities that need the face to face component. And when we can do that, we do that and not be um, constrained by oh well that's timetabled for week eight therefore we do it in week eight if if the circumstances arise that we can run a field trip or run a practical lab um we do it how that works operationally i don't know i think that's a bigger challenge um a further short-term challenge particularly in the uk where i'm based students have had 
the so school students have had their education massively disrupted um, and they ended up not uh, sitting their final exams for their A-levels and so um, we worked out that I think some of the students coming in this coming academic year won't have done any formal exams since they were 16 so they're likely to be struggle more with that adaptation to university learning um, and be pretty stressed out about the thought of having to do exams for the first time um, for, for real as it were. Uh, moving on to medium term um, again, this keeping current, this is more from me. As I move through my career, I'm becoming more and more involved in the management side of the school. And so staying current with up-to-date technologies does become more challenging because I'm just using it less in my day-to-day -day job. Um, and the other medium term I, I, I jotted down was taking advantage of the shock to reshape how education works. So um with this big shake-up that we've had to have what have we learned what can we keep um it's yeah it's something for for me to think about um long-term challenges again picking up on something i think it was serena said something that student all the feedback that we've had from students has been that they want in-person teaching but it doesn't seem to be that they want the, the teaching they want the social activities so i'm wondering whether campuses um, and southampton is a campus-based university it sounds similar to the pretoria setup where we have a lovely campus but whether that becomes more of a social hub and then the teaching remains more online so the difference between say a fully online course and a in-person course is more that wider university experience um i don't know um and i think that was about everything i wanted to say and i'm 12 seconds over so thank you for having me hey uh, so much thank you so much for that um i really appreciate everyone's uh, ability to to speak and organize your thoughts concisely for this uh, our next speaker right now on this topic is going to be uh, Sarah Fabricant from University of Zurich. Sarah. Yes, thank you. Hello, <clears throat> hello everyone uh, from Zurich, um, Switzerland. It's evening. So just maybe a brief, tiny background of my teaching or education context um, in Zurich. So um, I have been teaching all across the curriculum, in fact, the, the last one and a half years. So starting with second semester undergraduate, very large classroom uh, to a cohort of interdisciplinary PhD students all across the disciplines in at Zurich University in a specialized excellence program, as well as everything in between, you can imagine. And um, I also have had a chance to teach at two different types of schools, a Research One University, University of Zurich, but also um, at the School of Applied Science in Zurich and, and in different disciplines, one in cognitive psychology and, and one in my home disciplines, geography, GI science. So just to, to give you a background. So question number one, and, and I'm repeating what others have been saying. I'm just saying it with my Swiss accent. So ironically, uh, because of this, truly awesome breakout room option with uh, with Zoom. Um, I actually implemented flipped classroom elements as well in my large undergrad second semester cartography course. And this is something I wish for do, to do for a very long time, long before Corona. And um, so this meant uh, my version of a mixed kind of blended or whatever you want to call it uh, mode is I posted homemade podcasts uh, at first as well. Um, about lecture content online. Uh, and then this had to be consumed hopefully before uh, the first portion of, of, of the weekly lecture, which is now still ongoing. I, I taught this morning. And then we meet weekly for the second portion of the lecture time for, and this is live, we can do that. We have stable internet connections and so on. And, and students have been able to access and, and connect live online, the in-lecture activities that I've prepared then for sort of the second portion and, and Q&A and using breakout rooms and digital collaboration boards and activity sheets and online classroom response type activities, all live in this online mode. And amazingly of the approximately, you know, it's 150 plus students in class every week, 
up to two thirds of class actually attended the, this non-compulsory part of the, of the lecture uh, regularly every week. And it's been amazing the, the, the personalized interactions that we've had so far. Um, far more and i've seen also in the chat in fact I, I felt that actually attendance at least this year not last year uh increased inc incredibly and sort of the also the intensity of it so this is something that was completely new to me and which i've started doing so challenges short term basically uh, avoiding bouncing backwards um so the digital society is here to stay and for sure, in my case, and I'm sure and convinced for everyone, it won't be pre-corona anytime soon, if at all. And, and that means um, this kind of notion of face-to-face -face teaching that is sort of kind of the panacea of all teaching, or it seems to be, or it seemed to be, uh, of teaching and learning. So this has sort of gotten a new sort of dimension. You know, what does face-to-face -face mean nowadays? And um, I think it's critical for learning and teaching, but I think we really need to, to try to better identify where exactly and when exactly and for what exactly do we need really that face-to-face. -face. And, and this is something that will happen next term, right? If, if, if we come back, you know, to what do we come back to um, literally? And in the medium term, I think, and I'm picking up the, the discussions we had last year in this panel, I would really would, and this is not my term, I picked it up from someone, I don't remember who it was, but it's really superbly, uh, you know, what I'm trying to achieve is I would really wish that we can sustainably bounce forward. This is the term I really liked and I picked up from this panel. And thus trying to transition into some sort of a, whatever the poll said earlier, flexible blended teaching mode or hybrid or basically the kind of notion of learning anytime, anywhere together with anyone. So that uh, I think Gary, you mentioned it, you know, you know, these flexible digital tools that are small and in my pocket and maybe large at some sort or stable at a, at a desk. And so the question is, so how can we effectively and efficiently merge these kind of best of the both digital leap that we just took online, asynchronous, synchronous, collaborative and so on with this pre-corona face-to-face notion of on-site brick and mortar school type of teaching world. So what kind of teaching mode needs to be done where, when, with whom, and for what learning goals is, is my, my key challenge here. It is clear to me really that um, I need to further my teaching skills and competencies to fit that new world and uh, to do this effectively. And finally, uh, long-term, I think really what's, uh, you know, our university has given example is about to build, rebuild, extend, or reduce, you know, most of its infrastructure. So this is long time planning um, based on a pre-corona plan. And so um, I really don't think that we need what they planned then, uh, now, as it seems, right? We need less of that. We need more something of an infrastructure meaning even space, like literal, you know, like rooms to go to that, that, that must fit this new hybrid mode. Um, it has to be a different format. It has to be something new and it, it needs to be done uh, now already. So my question is what will my real world teaching space look like and, and what kind of time will I have available to align um, all this with, with this new blended teaching mode of the future. Finally, um, I think you know that was a best practice question also that maybe also leads to the next panel. Um, I think, and we talked about this earlier, good teaching is good teaching regardless. Um, so I think the flexibility and openness to change, um, smiling, empathy, kindness, you know, will go a very, very long way, you know, in, in even in so-called this distant digital online teaching mode, which I have realized and happened to me this year. So whatever it is, I think we need to also think about this hefty portion of these social skills and competencies um, for, for empathy and so on, for, for leadership in, in education and elsewhere, um, especially in, in as we see this increasing digital society um, that is actually trying to be inclusive and, and not widening that gap uh, of these social uh, and digital uh, domains that, that are opening up now uh, even more. Thank you. Thank Back you. to you, Diana. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah.
Um, and right, and then Sarah was referencing there a, a comment that we had from a panel back in the summer or fall of last year, the idea of resiliency. Um, one way to think about resiliency, which may be uh, better for all of us is, uh, is to bounce forward from, from the experience. Um, let's right now uh, jump to our bounce to our final panelist in this um, session right now, uh, John Lowry from New Zealand. And then at the end of uh, John's presentation, we will have uh, a, a few minutes for some group discussion. And I, I haven't been looking at the chat, but I, I, I'm, I trust our chat moderators to pull out a, a couple of questions we might have time for. So John, if, if you are there, the floor is yeah. yours. I'm here. Um, so I thought that I'd share an experience with you with regards to um, the first question. Um, it was during lockdown last year, or just as lockdown started, um, I needed to make a decision about the content of the course. And so instead of having a midterm test, I um, modified a small project to be a bigger project that would be done in lieu of the test. And the project basically involved um, having the students do a VGI project, a volunteer geographic information project. Um, they had learned how to use survey one, two, three. They learned about the, con the concept of VGI. They learned about creating story maps. Um, essentially what I wanted them to do was to pair up into teams of two and uh, to create a survey, implement it to anybody in the world, um, and then, then tell their story of what they learned from the data. So um, a lot of it was put onto them as to how they would make their teams. So, I'm going to use terms that are used in Moodle for some of these ways that I had them do this, but it, any learning management system I would imagine has similar activities. So I had them use a discussion tool to, to form their partnerships. And essentially I said, use the discussion to put out an idea you have for a project. And if you don't have a, an idea for a project, say, um, I don't have an idea, but I'm a good partner. Let's form up, let's, let's form a partnership. Then in a choice tool, they identified their team, their partner. Um, then um, later on in the semester, so it became a full uh, half semester project. They would share their story map with the class, with the wiki. And at the very end, they gave feedback to us instructors on um, how they got along as a team and essentially how the project went. And um, it went really well. Um, and I was really impressed uh, with how they got excited about it early on. They formed their own teams. They came up with their own ideas. And at the end, the feedback was great. Um, so I said, let's do this again this year. And so we're doing it this year. And um, I found that this year, there wasn't quite the enthusiasm for, for doing it like they did last year. Um, it took them a while longer to form their teams. And in fact, at some point I needed to prod them to, to pick their partners and I had to actually partner some people up. And I was trying to think about why that was. And, and I think it had a lot to do with the fact that this particular project last year occurred right as New Zealand was going into lockdown. And so there was this feeling of unity that particularly our prime minister here in New Zealand uh, uh, tried to emphasize. And uh, in fact, she used a term, uh, a Maori term, kia kaha, which means be strong. And so I was at first attributing the, the difference between last year and this year to this uh, kia kaha, this be strong um, idea where the students uh, wanted to work together uh, more than they, they did this year. Uh, but after some uh, further reflection on that, I think, although it would be nice to, to think of it as being a kia kaha effect, I actually think that what happened was that those students last year um, were locked down. They had less things to do. Some of them were no longer working and they were isolated. So, so they were more keen to work together with one another last year than this year. And the, 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 the semester is still going this year, so I haven't gotten feedback yet on how well the students liked the project um, this year. But I do know that they, they were less um, quick to, to form teams and work together. Um, 
So one of the things I think that I learned from that is, first of all, I think it's a good, good activity. I'm going to continue doing it. But students have their own lives. And, um, and so they've got other things going. And so we, we, we know that. And we always need to be um, a cognizant of that in our teaching. So that's the, that's the first question. Um, the second question uh, with regards to the challenges in the next few years uh, really is in line with what some of the previous speakers have talked about. Um, the, one of the challenges I face is that I teach, uh, I am required to teach a distance cohort of students and an internal or face-to-face -face, uh, cohort of students. And, I'm so, and I need to use the same learning management um, stream site or, or Moodle site for both. Um, and I need to make sure that there's parity. So essentially the two, the two cohorts need to be taught the same things in the same way and have the same assessments. Um, so what that does is that, what it does is it makes the internal group become really more of a blended um, uh, type teaching. And uh, because there's so much online content that I've already got um, you know, created for the distance students. And so the challenge I think that I'm gonna face and I think that uh, has been hinted at is what exactly is blended or hybrid and how do we make it work? Um, because uh, as some of, other, uh, some of the other panelists have talked about, Kate said that the students want to come to campus to socialize, but um, not necessarily to get the teaching. So if you, make the, if you make the course blended, you put more online content there, what I'm finding is the students don't necessarily want to come to class, right? How, do we, how is it that we're going to uh, encourage them to come to class? I, I definitely think that um, there can be good learning and teaching in both um, a distance mode and what from now on is gonna be a blended mode. We're not gonna go back to just plain face-to-face. -face. So with blended, we need to think about how we're going to um, encourage them to take advantage of any real face-to-face -face interaction if indeed that's what um, uh, our teaching mode uh, requires. And one last thing I'll say is that I think that um, we're always gonna be required to be doing some kind of face-to-face, -face, even though what that face-to-face -face means and how it's done is, uh, is gonna be what we need to try and uh, understand. And I think I'm a little bit over, so I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll end there. Well, that's a, a good place to leave it right there, John, because uh, I, I I think they're going to be probably sort of some discussion in the chat about uh, this tension about what's going to be happening when we when we go back, and that also preempts our administrators um, panel. But they have some thoughts about that too. Uh, but other so organizers from our who have been moderating the chat, can you uh, pull something out to share with us so that uh, we can have some discussion amongst the group or responses to any of the previous panelists' comments? I would say, Diana, that we haven't had any particular one question that stands out. We've had good conversation that I hope we can save and share with everyone. Uh, good. Good conversation regarding things such as attendance and is uh, certainly a division of opinion regarding whether we're getting higher or lower attendance in face-to-face -face versus uh, online learning. And so it'd be interesting maybe to drill into that at some point. I'm not sure we have time for that today, but something to have a closer look at for sure. Um, a potential issue regarding whether there's a difference between sort of geography or more sort of core students versus environmental science or other less core students, whether they're more or less successful making the transition. Um, a little bit of a discussion regarding sort of laboratories, GIS labs, sort of what's going to happen with these labs. Um, some of them are down in, you know, closed basements with not much ventilation. I just made a comment here in the chat window that maybe there's a distinction between many hours in the lab versus 50 minutes in a theory class. Um, you know, the sort of the nature of labs is that you spend more time sitting in a room with more people. So is that an issue? And uh, maybe people want to say more about one of these. Any comments from any of our panelists about those observations? 
maybe I just, you know, I, I think this lab issue is, is, is really, or attendance lab lecture, this is really a key. I mean, this is something, and, and I, I realize uh, in the chat, you know, some, some people had lockdowns, complete ones, some had half ones, and some had everything in between, right? So it, it really will depend, I, I guess, you know, and it will have to be resiliently, flexibly bound forward. Thank you, Kate, for, for sharing that uh, already last year with us. Um, it, it will really depend and we will have to be flexibly adapting to, to that situation. And this will happen everywhere. I mean, we cannot plan right now more than you know two weeks ahead, literally, which is super stressful, of course, but I think that's something I, I started to relax upon. It's okay. Uh, so I, I think this lab situation, you know, um, w will we ever go back to such a lab, you know, that you described, Michael? I, I really don't. I don't think so. Do people feel like what Jerry described is sort of this new transition towards sort of bring your own computer and that sort of thing? Is this reality? Is reality now such that in most cases you don't need to go to the lab to get your GIS? You carry it around with you under your arm and you can decide to have GIS class outside or in Starbucks or in a larger auditorium or something. Is that a reality? Um, I think, can I, is it okay if I jump in? Yes, please. Yeah, sorry. Um, so it, it's really interesting this, I worry about this move to all the cloud computing and making GIS accessible, which is it's great, but I do worry that we're losing some of the expertise that underlies that. Um, and so we, we had a, um, a big push on using this a thing called ThingLink, where anyone could make an interactive online resource that, which is, it's a really good tool, but one of the things they really push is using it for maps, but there's absolutely no cartography behind it. And, you know, the, some of the maps that they, they showcase as best practice are awful, if I'm completely honest. Um, and it worries me that, and I don't think this is a, a new challenge. I think it's, it's a permanent ongoing challenge that we're losing some of this. We're not losing it, it's being masked by pretty buttons. Um, some of this sort of expertise that goes on behind the scenes. Um, and I think if we lose, if everyone has GIS in their pocket, there's there's still a need for the the sort of hardcore experts underneath that. I think. Right. Serena, you have your hand up. Yeah, I think what what we are seeing is that that the lab is possibly going to disappear. So students come to campus for the internet. I think that's that's always going to be important, and they they may even some of them come to campus to sit at those computers, but these large sessions of people behind computers I think I think that's going to change somebody also said that um, uh, so I think students will have a choice of whether they want to be on campus or whether they not want to be campus and then we'll have this challenge with dealing with these uh, two groups and I think for practicals also we're going to see that and also just a comment on the previous um, on the previous comment. So there, there will always, of course, be a need. I think Joseph posted to that regard in the chat. There will always be a need for heavier, more intense, or more complex either computation or visualization, or whatever it may be. But when we're thinking about you know, implementing GIS across the geospatial curriculum and across um, you know, just many, many of these different disciplines, um, so the idea there was that folks don't have to be the GIS experts to be able to do this. And with the, some of the SaaS technology and things that we can do online, you know, one can still do cartography, one can still do analytics, one can still do all those sort of main core JS functions that we have. So just for simplicity of use and access, and again, you know, kind of what Mike said, like we can actually do a lot of this uh, regardless of, of location. Maybe that is the way of the future. We might not be there yet. But, um, but perhaps it is, and we're getting closer and closer to that, uh, to that point. And I don't know why my, my camera isn't working, by the way. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's a tweak on my no, end, but it's, anyway. It's, it's oh, working, it? Jerry. Oh, okay. yep, we've, got, we've got you there with the okay. beautiful sunset in the background, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, these comments about uh, labs and students 
happens on campus and matters of that uh, leads really well into um, the presentations that we're going to have next by a group of administrative leaders. I think their um, observations on some of these details might be quite interesting for us to hear. So uh, just to keep us all uh, on schedule here, um, we have we've invited four individuals who are going to um, share some observations uh, about this. And I'll, in a moment, I'll share their questions too. We have Libby Wentz from Arizona State University. We have Anthony Robinson from Pennsylvania State University. Peter Atkinson from Lancaster University. I typed all of these things out so quickly. I hope I didn't <laughs> get anything wrong. And then lastly, we have um, David McGuire, who um, uh, has uh, been a vice chancellor at several universities in the UK. And then prior to that, David actually served at Esri as its chief scientist here in the US. So I am very, we are very appreciative of all of the, the time for everyone today, including these um, administrative leaders with their perspectives. I'm going to advance now to the questions that we asked this group. Um, what do you think will need to change about teaching and learning GI science in higher ed? And our organizational uh, team was also very interested in how people with these perspectives that we've asked, how they think that might be different from any other digital technologies that are um, uh, an issue in higher education right now. So with that, I would love to invite Libby Wentz to, um, to speak to the group. Thanks, Diana, and thanks to, uh, to all of you for the invitation. It's great to see and hear from so many friends and, and colleagues from, from a long time ago. Um, the first comment that I want to make is just an observation on the time zone. Being here in Arizona, I'm kind of in the middle of the time zones, and it's merely two o'clock in the afternoon, so the timing couldn't be more perfect for someone like me. I don't have to be up early or, or up late, so I'm grateful for all of you for being at the edges of your, of your workday. Um, to the point of being the dean of the grad college, um, I uh, started the, this particular position uh, right as the pandemic started. Um, I was the Dean of Social Sciences for five years here at ASU, and then I stepped into the role as Dean of the Grad College right as the pandemic started to go, um, to take shape. And the first question that was asked to me from the provost office was, you know, what, is, what do the graduate students need going forward? Um, you know, and of course, this is across the university. I have engineering students, I have business students, I have students in the health sciences, as well as the students across the liberal arts and sciences. And of course, my, my initial answer was, well, I don't even know what students need in normal times, much less, um, you know, in these unusual times. And what I found is that, you know, anything that had, as we've kind of talked about so far, anything that had person to person activities, like the nursing students have to teach people how to give shots. You know, you can maybe test it out in an, in an orange or an apple, but it's not the same thing as having, you know, person to person contact. And of course, people who have any kind of field work uh, that they have to do or labs with, with animals and plants, things that have to, to stay alive. Um, so in some ways, the, the technology afforded by GIS um, made some of the, the transitions actually a little bit more straightforward. But what really came out in those early conversations is that, and, and this is one piece that I haven't heard uh, anybody mention here, um, although I think it's been implied, is really thinking about the health and well-being of the students, um, as well as health and well-being of the faculty. Um, and that's something from an administrative point of view that we all need to be mindful of as we start thinking about our changes and learning GIS and higher education. So how does, you know, how important are the social, do we recreate different kinds of social opportunities, which I've heard mentioned um, a couple of times, um, as well as the well-being of the faculty. Um, you know, we've got people who are, who are much more isolated um, and also thinking about, um, you know, individuals who have home responsibilities such as children and, and education opportunities at home. And all of those have had an impact on, on people's ability to be effective in teaching. And I think Serena said it early on in terms of the access to the technology, and I saw a lot of it in the chat as well. I mean, we had some of our GIS students trying to do GIS on their phones. Um, no internet access, uh, no real computers, 
and our library system started to send out uh, laptop computers to people uh, trying to make sure that people had um, access to it. Um, the, the, the next point that I wanna make um, is about resilience. I really love the, the title of this. I don't know who came up with this and I think it's absolutely fantastic in terms of how we think about being resilient. Um, there's a book called Judith, uh, that Judith Roden wrote um, called uh, Resilience Dividends. And she really taught, emphasizes the points around dividends. And what I've heard here uh, today um, already is a lot related to dividends. So you think of dividends as you solve a particular problem, like how do we continue to teach? Um, how do we continue to teach, but not necessarily share the virus? And of course, Zoom and other kinds of technologies have been a major part of that. And so when I'm thinking about things going forward, um, I think a lot about, you know, what are our dividends? Um, I've heard things like attendance. People are saying people, more people are attending things. Um, I've heard that a lot with respect to um, office hours. Students are coming to office hours that they might not have. I've also seen that the negative side of the attendance is that they log in, they turn their cameras off and they don't completely pay attention. So we need to think about, you know, of course students fell asleep in the back of the classroom before anyway. Um, but, you know, just because that you're there doesn't mean that you're necessarily paying attention um, or, or being engaged. Um, but some of the other dividends, and I love the, the chat, which of course when I'm talking, I can't really pay attention uh, to the chat. But I think the chat is a function that I don't know how we get back to. I mean, do you pass notes back and forth um, in the classroom? You don't really do that. That's kind of more of the private chat piece. But the chat really provides that um, engagement that you, that you don't really have in the, in the classroom in a different kind of way. Um, and the other piece that I've heard people planning to um, continue to do is having guest lectures uh, synchronously join a class, being able to have somebody, you know, you know, bringing Sarah uh, from Switzerland into to one of my lectures to do a guest lecture. Um, it would be a great way to sort of bring in sort of expertise and connections for your students that you wouldn't necessarily have. And I've heard a lot of people saying that they want to um, continue to do that. The last thing that I think is really important, um, we're in an era of, of maybe more, it feels like more um, extreme problem solving. Um, and I so believe in GIS as a, as a tool for really um, having the ability to bring data to light, um, see problems in unique ways, being able to see gaps in knowledge and gaps in services um, in ways. The pandemic of course is one pretty significant challenge that I know GIS has been so important into solving. But we also have you know, climate change, social justice, um, economic development, inequality, all sorts of other problems. And so I think that while other subject areas are also really critical in solving these, I think GIS is really um, important in, in doing so. So anyway, those are my, my few remarks that kind of wove around those two questions that I hope have provided some insights. So thanks for including me in this today. Thank you, Libby. Thank you for that. I think we'll hear some themes about uh, parity and equity and social justice um, from a number of uh, people. It's something that I, I think the GIS has a, an important role for. Um, uh, the next speaker in our uh, administrative leaders group is going to be um, Anthony Robinson from Penn State. Thanks a lot. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk in this group, and I, I definitely uh, don't feel worthy of my company as a senior administrator, certainly not following Libby Wentz. So <laughs> um, thanks for letting me share some uh, airtime. Uh, I speak about what I speak about today in the context of my work as director of our online programs and geography at Penn State. So we serve about 800 adult learners every year and teach about 100 course offerings across geospatial sciences and technology at the graduate level. Um, so a lot of it comes from that from that context. Uh, thinking about this prompt here about <clears throat> what we'll need to change about teaching and learning and higher ed and GI science going forward. I think one thing that it's brought to light uh, in my experience here has then been that research intensive universities like Penn State um, really need to continue to invest in and value expertise in teaching with technology. So in our <clears throat> geography department, we were already kind of in the middle of a multi-year process of improving the integration between our resident tenure track faculty and the fixed term online program faculty when the pandemic began. And 
Um, we had also had multiple decades, you know, more than 20 years of online program development and delivery experience at the university. We had already had started having some of our tenure line faculty teach periodically in the online programs and vice versa, have faculty in the online programs uh, teach in the resident program sometimes. I think this set us up pretty well as a department, uh, at least in terms of the GI science side of things, uh, to be quite resilient. Um, having people that were familiar with multiple modes of engagement already certainly didn't hurt. I think more specifically concerning GI science going forward, um, one of the things I think administratively we need to do better with is develop the structure and policy in our departments and colleges to ensure that we can really attract, retain, and sustain the careers of expert practitioner faculty. I've heard multiple people already mention this need for uh, staying current, and this is really hard to do. I think relying on research-focused tenure-track faculty to remain at the cutting edge of application, uh, teaching the most recent API um, in the latest LMS is not a great fit. Um, and we already have outstanding colleagues who are teaching oriented. Um, our students are gonna need a combination of both research and applied skills, and we really need to invest as much in the latter as we do in the former. Um, I think what that looks like uh, requires shaping some tracks outside of the tenure line that are really worth pursuing. Um, we've definitely made some progress here at Penn State with, with how promotion works in our fixed term uh, ranks. There's now changing the way this is even called. It will now be called something different <laughs> in the next couple months. Um, but there is still a need to figure out career paths that are um, equally uh, attractive and beneficial to retaining practitioner faculty. Um, treating, I think, half of our colleagues, which at least half of them in my case in the college, as though they're temporary is not only inaccurate, but it's self-defeating. When it comes to what I think is different that, um, about GI science than other subject areas um, and other dig digital technologies, I think one thing that I've noticed, at least inside of Penn State, is that there's much broader recognition now that engagement with spatial technology and methods matters. Um, I think this is now salient to a lot of people in administration that it wasn't before. Uh, for example, um, just the notion that geospatial tech and infrastructure has the power to kind of glue together a lot of disparate information. Um, an example of that would be the effort to rapidly develop contact tracing and testing on campus. All of that revealed the sudden need to coordinate spatial data across the institution in new ways. Um, I think I'm hoping, and I think it will become more common for the role of something like a chief geospatial officer to emerge within university administrations. And I think that role will probably be tasked to figure out this spatial glue. Um, and uh, some of the people who are in the audience on this call have already participated in writing about sort of the spatially enabled campus uh, looking forward. And I think maybe we didn't anticipate that the pandemic might actually usher that onward a little bit faster and more intensely. Um, one example of how that might pan out in the near term might be studying the airflow in cl classroom buildings and co uh, comparing that to national and local trends in student incidence and vaccination rates. Um, an interesting spatial problem that emerged early on was the attempt to model the incidence at where students were located off campus before they came back to campus in the fall. So it was a really uh, distinct spatial and temporal analysis question that suddenly had the attraction of the president of the university. <laughs> so um, that's an example, and I, I look forward to the non-pandemic examples that um, uh, will come up in the future where there are some interesting spatial synergies to take advantage of. Thanks. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you for those comments. Uh, to progress along, our next um, administrative leader that we're going to hear from is uh, Peter Atkinson. Peter? Hi, can you see me? Yes, we can. Thank very you. Very good. Well, thanks very much to um, Professor David Unwin for the invitation, and it's my pleasure to join you. Uh, this is a very hard set of questions. Um, I'm the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology at Lancaster University, and I do a bit of research in the background. Uh, and I was previously a professor at Southampton for 21 years. I can give three uh, personal thoughts from a research project and research student perspective, which might be a little bit different to the uh, conversation er earlier, but it's um, there's a lot of overlap uh, in what I'm about to say. But if I have time, I'll also tell you a bit about how Lancaster responded to the uh, pandemic. So my first thought is about coding uh, generally 
and as I say, it's a slightly different perspective than others. My perspective is really uh, centered on geostatistics and the R uh, programming language. I started using S plus in Bristol in 1990, which was 31 years ago, and I switched to R when that started. And R has been open and community based from the start. The environment is easy to download and install. It's very flexible, etc. And more recently, a whole host of packages and environments are open and free to download, such as Python, uh, environments like Keras and TensorFlow, etc. And remarkably, I find that PhD and project students are really well able to navigate through what is essentially a very complex uh, coding ecosystem uh, using Google as their friend, should I say that? Uh, and all of this was true pre-COVID and it continued uh, as previously through the pandemic. So I actually don't see uh, from this particular perspective that much has changed or needed to change. And in a sense, what this shows is that the GI science coding world was already resilient. Uh, and what's been happening in terms of collaboration virtually, which is actually quite interesting, is the use of virtual labs. But again, this was already happening pre-COVID. So in summary, that's my first point. Um, I'm noting that GI science, science coding ecosystem is resilient. And that's basically a similar point that was made by Jerry Miller and others earlier. So what's really different and bad, however, is the isolation that research students may be feeling. I don't think I've done anywhere near enough as a supervisor to mitigate that problem. I mean, um, being holed up in your flat in the middle of Lancaster or whatever, had infinitum, disconnected from your parents uh, and family with uh, no possibility of connection, no flights. Uh, they may be in another country, in one case for one of my PhD students in the USA. Uh, and through all of that, you're supposed to carry the burden and risk of a PhD or a research project in GI science. It's really, really tough. I mean, really tough. And we're all social animals. We just couldn't function without others. Uh, and so the way that I'm thinking about this is that study and research are just a brilliant thing. And, you know, it's, you know it's, for me, it's fantastic, really, study and research. But they can be thought of as the top of a hierarchy of needs and a privilege. Uh, but I've always believed and encouraged students that you've got to sort out the lower, lower levels like your own health and security and love and belonging first. And, and that's such an important point. So while digital innovation is great, and I'm sure that we will bounce forward, uh, let's remember how each individual may be feeling. Um, and love and belonging, interestingly, is that sort of middle level in, in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, so that's my second point, basically. Great learning isn't going to make you happy unless the lower levels are sorted out first. Uh, and, and social interaction is such an important part of that. Um, and then my third point is that COVID-19 uh, showed that it can be done. And, and what's happened there is that our limiting assumptions have been removed. We kind of blew away the paper tiger, um, uh, you know, different way of thinking, which is fantastic. And it's opened up a world of possibilities. But there's another caution, and that is that COVID also, in some sense, gave us the license or excuse uh, to do this. And without COVID, that license may not exist. So what's really key then in going forwards, I think, is managing student expectations and potentially exceeding them um, to use this kind of management uh, thought or, or, or phrase, you know, ex exceeding student expectations. So as we emerge from the lockdowns around the world, it's possible that student ex expectations will, will revert to some ex extent. And we need to be mindful of that, especially if others are reverting to previous practices in their provision, like face-to-face -face teaching Etc. And the trick may well be to exceed student expectations, but I believe that that will depend on digital innovation that is rooted in sound pedagogy, uh, a word that I always fail to pronounce correctly. But the, the, the basic point there is that student, students know when they've got it, you know, when they get the concept, they know. Uh, and so however we're uh, doing our uh, teaching, we need to make sure that, uh, that we're, we're grounding it in, in uh, sound pedagogy. So that's the end of my three points. I probably ran out of time, I'm afraid, to say anything about um, uh, Lancaster's uh, response to the pandemic. But in summary, my three points are basically coding was already resilient, uh, but being able to do coding without social interaction massively misses the point. Uh, and that while the space of possibility has been opened up by COVID, what's likely to happen in the future will depend on managing, meeting, or even exceeding student expectations based on sound pedagogy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those thoughts, Peter. 
Um, I, I think for at this moment, uh, we will pot, we will put a hold on that uh, Lancaster um, COVID story. We want to get to David, but let's let's see how we uh, how we do with time because I think we will have time for um, a number of uh, conversations towards the end. Our final speaker in this set is uh, is David McGuire. David. Thank you, Diane, and uh, hello, everybody. Very nice to see some old friends and to meet some new ones. Uh, as you know, in a, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I used to be a, a GI scientist and do GI teaching. Subsequent to that, I've done a number of other things. But really what I want to draw on today in my remarks is some work that I did in 2020, leading a national initiative of all UK universities looking at learning and teaching reimagined, which has been uh, published in a series of uh, six reports and you can Google that and have a look at them. So I want to make five key points really about how I think much has already changed in the way that we teach in universities, including GI science. Firstly, and pretty obviously, there's been a huge increase in the amount of online learning which now takes place in universities. Pre-COVID, our research shows that about 15% of all classes were delivered online. During 2020, it was something like 65% of all classes and about 90% of lectures in the UK. Most university leaders believe that that will settle down at around 50% in 2021, 22 and, and beyond. So a lot's already happening and everybody's saying that, it's, that the change is here to stay. We will not go back to a predominance of in-person learning anytime in the near future. Second point to make is that people's much, much more important than technology. Um, if I've learned one thing about leading universities, it's exactly that. And here I'd like to draw on uh, Lauren Stenhouse's imperative in a really good book where he said that curriculum development must rest on teacher development. Curriculum development must rest on teacher development. People are much, much more important than technology and without investing in people, making sure they've got the adequate necessary skills, you won't innovate in your teaching. In our survey of university leaders, the top barriers to online use in universities were number one, staff confidence, two, organizational culture, three, negative perceptions among students and staff. And only then do we get on Uh, skills limited funds and access uh, to hardware. So people are really important. A third point that we covered is that equity is really, really important in the way that we teach online and it has differential, differential impacts on different types of students. And as uh, more than one speaker have already said today, differential impact potentially on the staff, the faculty as well. And in the UK, a term digital poverty has arisen. If you want a definition of that, uh, Google the Office for Students uh, uh, and Michael Barber uh, and a paper, a report called Gravity Assist, where they define it, I think, uh, quite nicely. And essentially, it's saying that uh, poorer people from uh, minority ethnic backgrounds typically have poor access to technology and find it more difficult to create the necessary surrounding environment in which to study uh, successfully. But what's interesting is there's a huge concern for this and a huge effort to try and mitigate the worst impacts of that on students and staff. Turning to how we address these sorts of things, it's pretty obvious if you talk to university leaders that they need to take a strategic approach to solving these types of, of problems. And it comes down, I think, to a number of, of different things. Firstly, few university leaders have got anything like the skill set that they need or the experience to make the right sort of strategic choices in moving their universities into the online world. So they need support, they need help, and they need to trust others and work with others who've got the requisite skills. The second uh, point is that in order to get traction, it's going to be necessary to shift investments from physical assets to digital assets, to build the digital campus in preference to the physical campus. Our research showed that over the last several years, universities roughly invest in a ratio of about 10 to one. So for every um, one million pounds invested in digital assets, about 10 million is invested in physical buildings and, and, and campus infrastructure. And that needs to change. And most are saying that parity would be a reasonable outcome for the next few years, i.e. about half the investment in, in digital as well as physical assets. 
And it's pretty obvious also that we need to redesign uh, programs of, of study and to think about digital first rather than migrating from in-person to, uh, to online learning. The final point I want to make in, in, in this section here is that there is a huge dividal, digital dividend in prospect if we're able to harness these significant developments. You can move teaching out to address a much wider audience and attract a different group of, of people and make higher education, I think, much more successful. Um, had I had more time, I could talk about a few other things, but I'm conscious that my five minutes is up and I'll hand back to you then. Thank you. Thank you, David. I, um, I, I, I think, like others, I too was uh, taking notes during all of these presentations. I hope um, that some of this has been, uh, well, we'll be capturing this in a number of different ways. Um, uh, we have just a, a minute or so. Is anything from our chat moderators? Was anything uh, from the chat? Anyone want to pull up anything? that any of these administrator leaders, administrative leaders might reflect on. Or we can also shift, I haven't been watching the chat at all. I think uh, one of the big things, uh, conversations that have been going on is this need for um, uh, teaching uh, faculty and improving their role and making it more equal in the university. Uh, there's a lot of discussions going on about that. So, okay. uh, yeah, um, obviously with teaching becoming so important and with the, the conversations that have happened, uh, yeah, that's, that's a clear one. Uh, not many questions, but mainly comments about that. There were a couple threads that I heard from a few speakers. Uh, uh, the idea about having there be um, these, the career paths for expert faculty. Um, the expertise that many people bring to uh, teaching GIS is very different from the expertise that may be needed um, both with um, kind of modern and future geospatial technologies, um, but also the types of, uh, you know, being that expert at digital teaching itself um, versus the, the more familiar thing that um, a whole generation of people would have experienced. And the curriculum development must rest on teacher development. So that's, those are, those are um, connected themes. Yeah, I think that's a very, very important theme. And it links to what people were chatting about earlier. The students seem to have adapted to figure out how to use back channels and other sort of technical ways to keep in touch and to collaborate and do that sort of thing. And then, you know, we just heard that Apparently, in the UK, at least, according to these studies, uh, there's some some need for upskilling on the faculty side to get them sort of up to speed with these new ways of working. Right. Uh, rest assured, everyone, we will also be sharing links to the different um, reports that have been uh, referenced and mentioned and the different resources, um, uh, books and authors that have been mentioned by our speakers. We'll make sure we pull that together to share with the group as well. Um, well, uh, magically, we're on time. <laughs> so I am going to shift to what we had set up as uh, a question for questions for the whole group. Um, uh, important lessons about uh, best practice or leadership in teaching. Um, are old best practices still the best? Are new best practices emerging? And I think. Uh, uh, I think anyone, this is really for any of any of the, the speakers, any of the panelists that are here with us still from any of the panels. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at, at, at that right now. If someone would like, I can, I only, I can't even see everybody. We have such a large group right now. I can't see the thing. So if you'd um, like to raise your hand or if you have an observation about this, Anthony, I see your, your camera's on. Yeah, um, I had a, an answer I wrote down for this. So, <laughs> um, and I think it's something different that we haven't talked about yet. I feel like a, an important lesson from the past year that that's um, kind of brought something into light for us anyway, was that this diversification of our academic programs to include a really sizable range of online offerings proved to be a pretty major asset during this particular crisis. 
because we had learning designers and we had a cadre of faculty who were ready to do this kind of stuff. Um, the other thing that I would say that um, was kind of unexpected was that we had an open education courseware initiative, which happens to have many of our geospatial courses in it, that then that content turned out to be reusable by faculty teaching in resident program who had to switch to online. And uh, there, there was a lot of interesting uh, internal usage of that that we never ever had thought about. So it helped us be uh, resilient. Comments or observations about Anthony, uh, what Anthony has just shared or any other about this? I also had a had a uh, answer to that question. Can I share that? Yes, please. Um, <laughs> so I think I think somebody said a good teaching is good teaching, and I think that will that will remain. I mean, there are many basic principles that are the same, but I think the tools are changing. Um, and I think the interesting thing that the pandemic has done is it's brought some forces into motion. If you just uh, see all the reports that are coming out about reimagining and rethinking higher education, um, I think everybody is now ready to make a change where they maybe th the same way that we did in our classes is also uh, the administrators are now ready to uh, make a change because of what happened last year. So I think teaching will be different, but some basic principles uh, will stay the same. Uh, with regards to, to that, um, Serena and Anthony and others who also had comments earlier about the secondary school students coming up, uh, a number of people have um, made the important observation about about empathy, about kindness, about the, the challenges that um, all of the students, whether it's our current students or our future students um, have experienced. Uh, and when we think about old best practices uh, or solid teaching is solid teaching, what, what will that mean for the next one, two, three, four years of students coming in as undergraduates and as graduate students that have had um, really disrupted experiences in their in the immediate preceding academic experiences that they might have had. I think it might have been uh, Kate Parks. I don't know if she's still on. Um, who might have um, uh, mentioned before that that's something that at her university or at her department they might already be thinking about. Yes. Um, yeah, so it was me that commented on the disruption to the to the A level exams that we've we've had, um, and I think it's been noticeable in our first years. So they didn't have the formal exams last summer, um, and they've had a very disrupted first year. Um, not only on the social side, but you know we haven't the, the basic skills we haven't been able to pick up those who've missed it because we haven't been having that regular interaction with them. Um, so we've just been thinking about ways we can. You know, do we go back to doing kind of mock exams? If if we're going to expect them to do a formal sit down exam, we need to give them the training in how how to do that. Or, and I think I'm more in in this camp. We rethink those assessments. Do we need is an exam the best way to to test them in certain subjects? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I, I think yeah, we need to think right. about supporting them more into that transition. And has anyone thought about what it means? Uh, I know that it, we're having these conversations right now at Cornell University. What does it mean for the intermediate and advanced GIS courses for students who had their introductory courses um, taught in a very disrupted way, but also taught with a lot of flexibility and a lot of um, sensitivity to issues students were having when it went when it came to assessment and, and learning outcomes. So what does it mean for the for the learning progression over a course of a of a degree program? Kate? Mm. So I think you've just picked up on something that's really interesting there. I think although they have had all this disruption, in many ways that will make them stronger when they come out the other end of it in terms of being adaptive and able to learn and figure things out. Um, so I think in the chat, we talked about how students with Macs, I, I teach on Esri products, so therefore <laughs> it was a problem. Um, 
they had to adapt they had to learn how to remote desktop in and they're not necessarily techie students they're on environmental science courses they want to go and be conservationists they don't they're not computer scientists um and that's something that would have completely overwhelmed them and thrown them and they've done things that they never thought they could do and i think that's important to recognize um as well as recognizing the the difficulties that they've had and the challenges that that will have going forward Diana, there's a thread uh, building now regarding funding and regarding um, administrators sort of taking the time and the, making the investments to make these important changes. Great. Is there, um, can we have, could, let's have some discussion around that. Elaborate a little bit, Mike. <laughs> it sounds like both Davids have opinions. Maybe they can speak up. Super. I guess I started this, but it follows something that my former colleague, David McGuire, uh, hinted at. We have to get from where we are to where we will be in times when higher education is under stress, under financial stress. And certainly in UK, uh, I, I find it hard to believe that the necessary investment in all the infrastructure rejigging that we've been talking about uh, will, will actually take place. And if I were to mention Greenwich University Library to David, he would understand what I, I mean by this. Um, in the case where investment in a library is utterly inappropriate in the days of everything being online and everybody doing it through, through their machine. So th there's a huge shift and it needs investment. If, uh, infrastructure investment of all different types, infrastructure, yeah. human resources. Um, I, I don't see where, to put it crudely, I don't see where the money comes from. And that was Dave Unwin, who yeah. was uh, Sorry, just yeah, wrong Dave. Yeah. making those comments. So is there a reply from David McGuire? Is he still on? No. Sure, I can, I can respond <laughs> if you like. Um, I, 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 across the, the globe it, it's always possible universities invest um, tens of millions of pounds a year in different things so it's an opportunity cost it's a question of choices and if these things are given high enough priority then i think the money can be found in order to invest in, in these things and what's slowly dawning on university leaders uh, is the critical importance of technical infrastructure and of making these sorts of strategic in investments because universities, I think, are beginning to realize that if they don't evolve, they're likely to die. And, and so these things are beginning to happen. The trouble is that people don't have the wherewithal, the skills or the experiences, as I said, in order to um, know how to uh, enact those uh, grand plans. So it might be a little messy and awkward, but eventually it, uh something will happen because the question will be forced. The, the won't be an, an easy transition, but it will be a transition. Something will happen. Is what I think uh, some things David just said. Yes, Peter, please. Yeah, I was going to tell my response uh, about the important lesson, and it was just my experience, really. I, I'm a member of the university's uh, goal team and the pandemic response team uh, at the sort of centre level. And early in the pandemic, I wanted the, the university to move quickly to fund the best online teaching uh, resources, but uh, that didn't happen. Um, I wanted Lancaster to be ahead of the competition and not just lift and shift what it was doing in person to online. Uh, but Lancaster is a very complex and distributed system and there's a lot of individual and group autonomy and that's kind of respected so there's a principle there about supporting academic freedom but that's really a positive way of spinning it I think and I think David's point around in actual fact the leaders uh, didn't have the wherewithal to know you know what was needed and what to do etc early in the pandemic to be honest I think uh, we're still we're still finding a way our way 
What is true, though, is that uh, through that distributed system, some best practices really have been, you know, they have emerged and they're stunningly good. So, so there is local innovation, and now that the, the job, in a sense, is to share that across uh, from you know one neck of the woods to a, the, a different neck of the woods. But it's a, it's a really it's an evolving way of doing it, and and you know, if if you have uh, if you have a sort of a, a, it, it's surprising to me in retrospect that people weren't quick to act, weren't quicker to act, because it was all fairly, you know, fairly clear how long it was going to be around and that we were going to move in this direction. So, so there's a certain amount of uh, frustration. But the good news is, I think that best practices did emerge out of that sort of uh, complex ecosystem. So Peter, that's, that's a really important comment. Do you think from, from your perspective, from your experience, that having um, uh, having a sense of what those best practices are, things that worked uh, particularly well at your university. Is there any different sense of collaboration or sharing uh, between, uh, between universities where there might have been more naturally just, um, you know, naturally competition uh, more in the past? No, uh, no. <laughs> the, it, it's not my domain. But I think I think there is um, there's still a sort of a, a, a sense of wanting to uh, uh, well that we're still emerging aren't we and we're, st and we're still wanting to be you know attractive and be the best at what we do etc et so there's bound to be a certain amount of competition but certainly within the university there's sharing of uh, best practice across because we're sit with it's really obvious who's doing a really good job and and, and what's working so so you're the what you're referring to as the sharing is an internal internal to your university to really help all pull each other up uh, some of our earlier panels um, found that, and this is just an observation for any anyone, we, we found uh, that uh, instructors felt very strongly about trying to find ways to collaborate with each other. You know, things like sharing these panels is one little baby step, but many faculty have talked about wanting to share resources, share practices, best practices. Um, uh, do anything else to help each other because everybody was uh, kind of going through the same thing and we had many common out uh, desired outcomes um, for student success, not just learning outcomes for particular geospatial things, but student success in general. So do we think that there's um, a different sense of that willingness and eagerness to, to collaborate and work together to solve problems? It's different at the, between the faculty uh, faculty and instructors than uh, than it is at the institutional level. Kate. Yeah, I think you've really hit the nail on the head. When you talk to people individually, you know, in, in this kind of a group, everyone wants to work together and produce resources and it's going to, you know, we're going to do amazing stuff. Um, and then you get to the logistics of how you allocate time to doing that from the administrators, how you, who owns my brain who owns my intellectual property am i allowed to share it can i put it on the web for people to use and it very quickly becomes impossible if well yeah what hard work, incentives right what incentives does your university have to have mm. you try to uh, uh help help others externally yeah sir fabricant uh, yeah, thank you uh, for, for again these very stimulating <laughs> inputs uh, all along and that's like having, you know, probably like my students uh, following the chat looking at the lecture and the discussion, um, but um, I wanted to just also put in a little bit of a positive note, uh, maybe contradicting a little bit Kate's comments. Um, we have, um, of course, I'm operating in a German speaking world and we have this new term, the English term called, I don't know if it really exists in the English speaking world, town hall. This is this new thing that appeared because of COVID. What is it? It's, you know, let's get together and chat with one another. Well, what a great idea. Well, we just do it online now, right? So it's this idea of this town hall or this forum like the Roman times where, hey, we have this problem. How do we teach and you know what works in, in your teaching? Just let's sit together or stand together and, and just online chat with one another. And this has really happened uh, all across uh, the different universities uh, at least I have uh, access to. Um, so in Zurich, you know, quite a few uh, large educational 
facilities of various kinds. And, and this has just become a thing. And even in our department, we have had sort of these gatherings. It's like, oh, you know, how do we, how will we do these digital exams? And faculty wants this, and we, we should decide some other thing because this is our department and we will decide how we would like to teach. So it, it has actually generated a sense of community of, um, of, of, practice, of best sharing best practices. Maybe it's not like you know a lab or a handout or whatever, but it maybe is an idea or okay, let's sit together and let's figure this out. Or let's, as Libby said earlier, let's invite people from elsewhere in the world. Now we can do it and, and maybe we can even share and, and, and do it across the class and so on. So I, I think um, because of the digital, we have do, been doing or we, we may be willing of, of doing things we didn't dare to do just to talk to the colleague next door uh, who is now next connection um, and, and to ask, hey, how, do, how are you doing this thing with your teaching? And it doesn't matter if it's GIS or, or human geography. So um, I, I think that is definitely something that has happened um, in my domain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've talked before in a previous panel about the role of open educational resources and intellectual property. Um, it's a, it, it's an, on, an ongoing important and interesting topic within the geospatial sciences. Okay, we're coming to the, it's the bottom of the hour around the world. Uh, it's, it's, that's a very spatial way of thinking about it. Um, are there any, uh, as other people from the organizational team said, you know, we get together the 30 of us um, from around the world, we could talk about these things uh, for hours, but we really have to um, put an end to it at some point. Uh, are there any uh, final questions that have come up from the chat that we want to do just as part of our wrap up? As I said before, I think we should be sure to, to save and share the chat. There's a lot yes. of good stuff in there. And I think probably what people had to say, they've already done so. In the okay, chat. sounds that sounds good. There is, I, we put together one final poll, which is just to get a, a pulse of the group's ideas about um, their uh, interest in continuing some of these conversations. Um, uh, you know, in person, whatever, whatever in person might mean in the future. Um, uh, in 22 or 23, we realize it might be a little bit of time, but there are a number of us um, really committed to uh, working on these things uh, as part of our careers, not, not just a, a passing. I don't know if you guys can see this on my screen, but this is pretty exciting. I'm seeing the results live come back and there's uh, more people say yes than others. And there are yet, there's yet to say anybody who does not want to uh, um, uh, emphatically or categorically say uh, no, not interested in this topic going forward. We are not seeing the results, but I think yeah. that, I think when you save the recording, you'll also yeah. be saving the results, and you can share. Yeah, it, it will. And Forrest, our technical manager, Forrest Bullock, in the background, uh, <laughs> has, knows how to do all of these things just the right way. Just uh, okay. just know that um, they're they're appearing live on my screen, and um, the majority, uh, sixty five percent, would uh, be interested in participating in an in person event. Um, wherever we have no idea how that might happen or when, but but um, we all know we care about the topic. All right, well, I am going to move on to our just final slide that's right here, which is just a uh, sincere from the bottom of my heart. Thank you to the rest of the organizational team who has spent many months pulling these together um, and to all nine of our panelists today. That was, um, you woke up early, you stayed up late, or maybe you just skipped your afternoon nap. Thank you, thank you for being here. Um, we will be posting uh, this recording as well as uh, transcripts of the chat the way we've done in the previous uh, instances at our globalgiscienceeducation.org website. and. Again, just um, I'm going to sign off now, but I really want to thank everyone for being part of this today and for contrib contributing your your ideas, your time, your energy, and and your thoughts. 
thank you everyone very much. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Dana. All right. And thank everybody. You, Diana. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, everybody. Bye, bye, everyone. everyone. Bye, bye. Stay healthy. You okay, too. Bye. Thank you. Some people need to go to sleep now. Yep. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, let's start our day. <laughs> the people in New Zealand and Australia who I feel the most sorry That's for. right. That would be uh, married in New York. All right. It's happy, it's happy hour in New York. I'll see everyone later. <laughs> All, All right. right. Bye, Thank everyone. <laughs>